Hi, welcome. I'm uh, Rain Steinberg, CEO at ARCA. Uh, welcome to the How the 2024 Elections Will Impact Digital Assets. I'm joined with a terrific panel here. Um, let's start with you, Tyler, and then we'll uh, get to the presentation. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, Tyler Williams, I am the head of public policy and lawyer on legal team at Galaxy Digital. And I previous backgrounds, I spent a couple of years at the Treasury Department in domestic finance from 2018 to 20, and then uh, seven to eight years on Capitol Hill, both in the House and the Senate, working on financial services and banking committees. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Kevin Wysocki. I'm at Anchorage Digital. I lead the policy team there. Um, I'm a previous Hill staffer. I was on the Hill for about seven years, and I've been a lobbyist for about five years. Catherine. Hi, all. I'm Catherine Kirkpatrick Boss. I'm Chief Legal Officer of SIBO Digital. Prior to joining SIBO, I was General Counsel of Maple Finance, the DeFi protocol. And prior to that, I was a partner at the global law firm King and Spaulding, where my practice was white collar defense, government investigations, corporate compliance, and regulatory matters. I also co chaired the firm's financial services industry and their blockchain industry as well. Thank you, guys. Um, and just before we get started with the substance, uh, some obligatory disclaimers. Uh, this commentary is provided as general information only and is no way intended as investment advice, investment research, legal advice, tax advice, a research report, or a, any sort of recommendation. Uh, now that we have that out of the way, um, guys, I think we can all agree <laughs> uh, that this has been an incredibly um, let's say dynamic uh, political environment, and then you layer in uh, how it affects the incredibly dynamic and volatile environment of digital assets. Um, and you just have a lot of variability uh, and uncertainty um, that both our clients and I'm sure people that work at your firms um, are, are feeling as well. Um, I think at the, the, the top level, uh, the first thing we just wanted to start off with was to get your views on kind of a, a differences between the Harris and Trump uh, potential regulatory environments. Um, and let's start off with uh, maybe the Harris environment, even though we know less about it, um, just views since it might be seen as a continuation of Biden. Uh, do you want to start, uh, Tyler? Sure, glad to kick it off. Um, I think with both let me let me start from the level set of with both Trump and with Harris. I think it's a Please. little bit uncertain in terms of the specifics behind uh, regulatory agendas with both um, with both candidates. Uh, I think Trump has been more forward leaning and embracing and communicating with the community, which has given a positive signal to the crypto environment. And we obviously saw him go to Bitcoin Nashville this year and give a speech. And he has embraced the fundraising crowd, which is a core element of every campaign. Uh, with the Harris team, it seems as if they are uh, engaging in a positive manner with the crypto community. They're taking meetings. They're having discussions with the key participants. So it seems as if there's a, a bit more receptiveness in terms of how they might treat a future uh, regulatory agenda relative to innovation and digital assets. But I think they have been even more um uh less definitive in terms of the specifics of where they might go uh but i would i would uh take a snapshot and draw that back a little bit and say that they haven't really provided concrete policy agendas on a variety of areas not notwithstanding just crypto so i think they're going to continue that sort of route where they're not going to be specific on policy great thanks um Catherine, please yeah, so I definitely want to call out the fact that a lot has been said about the fact that the official Republican position not only mentions crypto, but is pro-crypto, whereas the Democrat Democratic position doesn't really mention it and makes some negative statements with respect to emerging technologies. I, I think that we can take that with a grain of salt. I definitely think Tyler's correct in that we've seen extensive engagement from Trump. I mean, in part, obviously, because he has a vested interest in this ecosystem now. You know, he's, there's a Trump NFT. People are contributing to the campaign with crypto. He's selling his shoes and accepting crypto. So he's actually engaging in a tangible sense with the ecosystem to more of a degree than the Harris campaign. I like to remain 
cautiously optimistic that the Harris campaign will definitely be more open to crypto than what we've seen from the Biden administration, in part because, let's be honest, cutting to the chase here, money talks. At one point, and I'm not 100% sure if it, this is still the case, but the Fair Shake Super PAC was the single biggest single issue super PAC, which is just stunning when you think about that. And, and if those uh, if people aren't familiar, that's a, that's a crypto super PAC. So there's really a lot of money flowing in from crypto, and that's going to ensure that people take notice. Uh, there's also certain major precedent developments. I, I'm talking in, in particular to uh, the fact that Chevron deference ha was recently overturned. That is potentially going to spur legislative action. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people are thinking that they're going to feel the effects of sh the sh Chevron change through the, the actions in the court or the SEC is going to back away from crypto litigation. I actually don't think that's the case at all. I think if crypto is going to feel anything positive from that, it's going to light a fire under either a Harris or a Trump administration by saying money's flowing in. We need to address this major Supreme Court de decision. So let's actually move on this legislation that's been percolating for years and years and years that we're all dying to have. Great. Kevin, anything to add to that? Yeah, I would just say that I think industry has a tremendous opportunity right now to influence what like policy of either a Trump, Trump administration or a Harris administration could be down the road. Uh, both sides are taking a lot of meetings. Um, both sides have said positive things about innovation. Obviously, Trump has said more specific about crypto. Um, but we have heard uh, some specific things uh, with regards to like Maxine Waters, while she was at the convention, who's the chairwoman of, or excuse me, the ranking member for the Financial Services Committee in the House, right? Um, she said that crypto is going to be a priority moving forward. Um, obviously, we had some major votes in May where significant Democrat players in Congress like Schumer and Pelosi voted for crypto legislation. So I'm starting to see a change um, where it's crypto is becoming more and more bipartisan. And I think that's going to continue into the future, regardless of who's in the White House. OK, great. Um, maybe this is a good place to talk about um, what actually happens uh, in the regulatory environment. People have, you know, kind of this view, um, this very binary thing occurs, either a Trump or Harris uh, administration. Um, but what really happens mechanically um, when one administration takes over? What type of changes can we see and how long will these type of things take? I'll, I'll jump in on the elephant in the room, the SEC. Uh, I don't think people realize necessarily how this all works. Um, the SEC has five commissioners who are appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate. And they're, they're actually appointed to five-year terms and they're staggered so that one commissioner's term ends on June 5th of every year. And we actually saw Commissioner Crenshaw's term end in June. They can continue to serve up to 18 months after their terms expire if they're not replaced. So, you know, Crenshaw may be around for 18 months. Um, and there's a balance in terms of the, the parties of either, uh, uh, you know, kind of the makeup of the commission. If, if Trump wins, everyone, I, I've heard a lot of chatter on crypto Twitter that, you know, Gensler's out the next day. That's actually not necessarily true. Um, Chair Gensler was appointed in 2021. He has just under two years left in his term before he's renominated or replaced. So he actually will still have 17 months left on his tenure if, if you know Trump takes office. Now, what traditionally happens in that situation is that a SEC chair from a different party would resign when you know a new president is elected. Obviously, the SEC has taken a lot of different actions that are unpredictable. So we can't necessarily rely on the fact that that the SEC chair is going to resign if there's a if there's a Trump election or Trump win. Um, I would say he most likely is, judging from historic precedent. Uh, whether or not Trump could remove Chair Gensler immediately, that's actually completely unclear because the Constitution doesn't expressly grant the president this power, and nor does the securities laws. So point is, that's probably more information than anyone needed. If Trump wins, he will likely move to replace the SEC chair. I am not necessarily saying that that's going to be a get out of jail free for all of crypto and there's going to be a ticker tape parade because we cannot necessarily rely on the fact that, that Trump would appoint 
an SEC chair who was entirely positive towards crypto. Many people might remember that when Chair Gensler was nominated, a lot of people were cautiously optimistic that he would be very pro-crypto given his extensive experience as an academic. So as much vetting as a presidential administration can do to, to various stakeholders, they don't get to control. They're not puppeteers behind regulators. You know, regulators have a degree of independence to develop their own mandate to, to a certain extent. Makes sense. Um, Tyler or Kevin on that point on the mechanics? Yeah, I won't talk about the SEC because Catherine covered it pretty well, but let me just um, back up and give sort of a macro overview because I think it would be um, helpful just as a level setting. Whenever there's a transition or between administrations or if there's a continuation of an administration, there are transition teams that are populated by staff on the campaigns and they're usually senior leaders that are important to each respective candidate. And they, they build out different teams uh, relevant to specific agencies whether or not they're cabinet agencies or they're independent regulators, such as the SEC or the CFTC. And there are teams dedicated to um, looking at and evaluating the policies of the administration and uh, then proposing new or continuation of those uh, policies and regulations into the future. And it's uh, incumbent on both of those transition teams to be really specific on the details of the policy. I think that if there's a continuation of a democratic administration, what we might see is an opportunity for the industry to engage on some of the, the substantive policies that have put forth relative to crypto. And you can have a, a laundry list of things like at the SEC, we know that SAB 121 has been a very controversial issue for the industry. If you look at the SEC, we know that the uh, the uh, the rules and the regulations proposed relative to like broker dealers, to custody, to exchanges, those are obviously controversial issues relative to the space. So you might see an opportunity to re-underwrite pieces of that or have re, uh, rule reproposals. If you have a change in the administration, meaning that we're going from um, Biden, Harris to Trump, Vance, I think we'll see a whole of a different approach. We'll obviously have different people in the positions, and uh, and every administration is entitled to have their cabinet, entitled to have their different regulators. We'll see a, a different approach in there, and then we'll like we'll we'll likely see a more accelerated um, um, evaluation stage where they're looking at the policies that are put forth, not just on crypto but on everything, and they're saying, can we repropose this or can we redefine how this was a approach from the Biden administration? Great, thanks. Kevin? Yeah, I would say that personnel is policy, right? Um, and, and different people could uh, be put into these various positions at the prudential regulators, the market regulators. Um, we're regulated by the OCC as the first and only federally chartered digital asset bank. Uh, we've worked closely with them. Um, the OCC has really led on things like symposiums related to uh, tokenization of traditional assets. Um, and then Folks in the administration, like I'm thinking the Nellie Liang, uh, the Deputy uh, Treasury Secretary for Domestic Finance, um, has talked a lot about tokenization of assets and stable coins and things like that. Um, and then if there's a change, like in the White House, I think there's going to be a lot of shifting. Obviously, if Trump uh, wins, there's going to be Republicans in these spots. If, if Harris wins, she's going to probably want her own people in these spots. And all of those folks are going to have to be confirmed by the Senate. And we don't know yet what the Senate will look like. Uh, but I think uh, conventional wisdom is most likely that the Senate will be controlled by Republicans, not necessarily that it will be. Um, and anyone that gets pushed through will have to get a, a roughly a simple or have to get a simple majority of support. Um, so I think uh, the complexion of the Senate will influence who's actually put into some of these positions at the agencies. And I think that will be good for the crypto industry. Great. Um, on that, um, we spent a little bit of time on the federal side of this. Um, is there anything going on at either non-federal level, either Senate or Republicans? You, you mentioned Maxine Waters and some changes there. Or is there anything in the down races um, that people could look for um, that are either pro or anti-crypto or things to look at there? Do you want to start, Kevin, uh, since we've gone? Kevin. Sure, sure. Um, so one notable retirement is Patrick McHenry, the chairman of the House Financial Services Committee. 
Uh, there'll be a new lead Republican on that committee. Uh, the candidates for that both are strong crypto advocates, um, but it, it will be a new person at the helm there. So that'll be interesting to see um, that change. There are also some notable leaders like uh, Wiley Nickel from North Carolina. He got district redistricted out of his seat. He had done a lot for the industry, uh, working with the White House and other folks. So those are some changes. And then um, there's a big Senate race in Ohio. Sherrod Brown has a race. Um, he's the chairman of the Senate Banking Committee. Um, and I think it was Catherine that brought up earlier Fair Shake and some of the, the other PACs related to crypto that are involved. Um, those PACs have said they're going to dedicate roughly $12 million to his political opponent in the near term. Um, and that could change, you know, who's the top Democrat in the Senate Banking Committee next year. Um, it's, it's a tight race right now, but, uh, and then thinking like if he were to lose or something, well, who's the next person to step up on the Senate Banking Committee for the Dems? Uh, I think by seniority, that might be Elizabeth Warren. Um, so there are a lot of factors here. Um, who's who's gonna be holding the gavel, so to speak, um, in these committees and and having more influence. The Great. other thing I, I can call out on the state front, uh, in addition to what the election itself will do, is what we've seen is a lot of state activity in the past year or two that we continue to see. A lot of states are moving to create something similar to the New York DFS infamous bit license regime. We had a state, uh, we had a similar regime passed in California that will come into force, I believe, in 2025. We've had several attempts to pass a similar law in New Jersey, Illinois, like that's that kind of activity is going to continue. Um, that's going to be and should be a big focus area for young crypto companies that are seeking out uh, or engaging in, you know, money transmitter esque activity or certain other activity that could qualify or necessitate licensing on a state level because it creates significant burdens on compliance, headcount. Uh, costs, registration fees. Now, I would like to hope that some of that state activity might slow down if we see some significant federal legislation, if only because it makes it more difficult for states to actually create a regime that might conflict with a federal regime that's put into place. So if the election pushes, it, pushes us towards kind of um, federal legislation, that could kind of soften some of the the increasing state activity we've seen and continue to see. Great. Tyler, anything to add on the Senate or down races? Yeah, um, just a couple things to add. I think that we have, and in the crypto industry, we've grown accustomed to the leadership of Patrick McHenry and some key allies in the House to advancing progressive legislation for the industry. And as Kevin pointed out, that's a big loss for the industry in terms of Patrick McHenry retiring. And we are seeing that like both of the candidates on the Republican side to lead the Financial Services Committee are supportive of the industry. The thing that I'm watching, too, is the, the Senate leadership races, uh, because we obviously have the Senate Republican leader who is retiring. And we have uh, a couple different people in the mix for the next Republican leader. Who that is will likely dictate whether or not the any progressive legislation receives floor time, because that is the, the challenging issue in the Senate. And then depending on who uh, wins the presidency, that can change the balance of what the first 100 days looks like for a legislative session. It affects whether or not Congress pursues tax reform and reconciliation, or if they pursue other types of core uh, campaign promise type legislation. The other thing that I would note is that the, the Bitcoin mining community in particular has been rel relatively influential in the Trump team. And many, many of them um, are domiciled in Texas, and we'll see significant state legislative activity in Texas early 2025, because it is, uh, because the Texas legislature is only in session for the first four months or so every other year. I think we'll have some attention that has been focused on New York and California activity this past year on a state level reshift to Texas over the next um, six, seven months. Great. Um, we've talked a little bit or alluded to uh, some of the individual pieces of legislation like Saab 121, um, and may maybe it would be helpful uh, for people that aren't quite that close uh, to the specific things that are 
uh, in the various regulatory and uh, legislative bodies that are going around. Uh, are there any particular pieces of uh, legislation uh, working their ways through, you know, Congress or the Senate uh, of note for people to watch out for that might have implications for crypto? Yeah, I'm happy to kick off. I please. I, I personally think that even though there's been quite significant activity in the House pushing market structure legislation, we've seen the stablecoin legislation that the, the Financial Services Committee moved out of the committee be held back. And I, I think it's being held back because there's a prospect of negotiating room at the end of the year post-election uh, to get a deal done on stablecoin legislation. Uh, that's a possibility. I would say like anything in Congress, it's a, it's a jump ball at best. I wouldn't handicap it as like a high percentage play, but it's it's definitely in the mix. The, the thing that's been happening that I've paid close attention over the past six months is in the Senate Ag Committee, we've had um, uh, Senator Stabenow from Michigan, who's retiring, uh, really try to reignite and jumpstart the market structure, legislative discussions in the Senate Agriculture Committee. It appears to me that it's been a bit stalled and there's some hesitancy on the Republican side for engaging in that uh, just because the prospect of what happens post-election uh, is a little uncertain right now. I think you could see something like both of those initiatives be restarted. I would just say it's an it's open question of how uh, likely it is to happen. But I would note that we, we've seen Senator Schumer um, you know, say pretty publicly that he wants to get something done um, uh, this year. I think that something is just really uncertain right now. Great. Yeah, I think his exact words were that it's absolutely possible to, you know, pass <laughs> crypto legislation by the end of the year. But unfortunately, he's not the only one in the room. And, you know, Kevin mentioned the Ohio race earlier, but, you know, crypto has spent, I think, you know, in excess of $10 million trying to defeat Sherrod Brown. So it, crypto has also made significant enemies through the, the spending that I referenced earlier. Uh, and I, I said this to this group when we had a chat prior to this webinar, but from the chief legal officer, general counsel perspective, at a point I was trying to track all of the various crypto bills, because obviously if there's one thing that's going to have the most impact on a crypto company, it's going to be federal legislation, market structure legislation. We're all dying to see that enacted to provide regulatory clarity, which continues to remain like in my mind, the last significant barrier to widespread institutional engagement with this asset class. Uh, that, that being said, there have now been so many different bills proposed with so many different iterations. It is truly hard to track or focus on any of them. I mean, obviously your policy team is, is well positioned to focus and track and engage with legislators on those bills to make sure the definitions are appropriate, things are not being inadvertently captured or they're not too broad or too narrow, et cetera. Um, even where the bills don't necessarily affect your entity, but might have a triple down, trickle down effect on, you know, the, the ecosystem that could affect your your day-to-day uh, -day business. Um, but beyond that, it's very hard to predict what, if anything, is going to get significant traction amongst the, the many, many pieces of legislation that have been introduced or are going to be introduced or are going to be revised. Kevin, anything to add to that? Yeah, I'll add some specific context to some of the Senate stuff. So, um, there are 12 legislative days left between now and the November 5th election. Um, and then from the election to the end of the year, there are only 20 legislative days. September 30th, the government is no longer funded. Uh, so presumably Congress is going to have to spend some time on that. Um, and then like post or prior to the election, Schumer may want to take some very like big messaging bill type votes. He may want to move through some judicial nominees. Um, I guess there's a possibility that he could try to move through some of um, the folks that are nominated for the SEC or the CFTC. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is there's just not a lot of time left. So it's going to be very, very difficult to move any legislation before the end of the year. However, I will say um, it's not impossible. Uh, if everyone wakes up one morning, like we're going to get this done, um, it could happen. I would think uh, it would be during the holiday season at the very end. And folks are just like, you know what? I just want to clear the deck. I'm, I, we've been working on crypto for a long time. 
we have some ideas that have been out here for a while. Let's just get something done. I would say there's like less than a 5% chance of that happening, but if it were to happen, it would probably be something along those lines. Um, to get to that point though, you probably have to have the Senate Agriculture Committee mark up uh, the Digital Commodities Act in September. Um, that would have to get pretty good bipartisan support. Uh, Warren has said she's opposed. Bozeman, the ranking member for the Republicans, hasn't yet said where he stands. Um, there have been a couple of outstanding issues, one in particular about where or how much discretion the SEC has in deciding whether or not a digital asset is a security. Um, it sounds like there's been progress made on that point, but um, we the bill yet hasn't been introduced at this point. So you got to get that vote. And then um, probably after the election, then you'd have to have some kind of Senate uh, approval and a, a, an amendment process. So you could have something like stable coins, BSA, AML things added in. Um, and then presuming if it passed the Senate, then you could try to reconcile the difference between Fit 21, which passed in the House in May, with record support from Democrats and almost all the Republicans on board, um, and then try to attach that to some kind of must pass vehicle. So the stars pretty much have to align perfectly at this point for that to happen, but that would be the scenario um, for it to come together. Thank you. Um, we had, we've had some questions, and since you mentioned it, um, we've mentioned, heard her name several times, and she's kind of seen, I think, as a bete noir to the uh, crypto industry, Senator Warren. Um, and uh, just the motions of her involvement with the Harris administration. Um, is there anything that we can read through from being featured prominently at the DNC um, to Harris wanting to continue Biden policy on this. Um, we, we all know that there was some sort of deal that was struck when Biden, you know, um, consolidated, uh, you know, his political situation in South Carolina in 2019, uh, that Warren was given broad uh, oversight of, you know, a lot of consumer protection and financial services. Uh, this is seen maybe rightly or wrongly, uh, maybe you guys have opinions on this, has been an impediment to digital assets can you a comment on that or would somebody like to comment on that and then any read through on more interaction uh from warren um or anything that we could say about that in the harris administration yeah i'll take the first time <laughs> sure. it's a uh sticky uh, topic for sure i i think it's without question that Warren has had an outsized influence on the financial regulatory complex and the people and personnel within the uh, Biden administration. I think that if you look back of where we started in the crypto industry and the Biden administration, there was the relatively progressive, at least writing in context of the executive order that they put out at the beginning of the administration. And then you had uh, the blow ups of 2022, uh, and you fast forward to like a very heavy um, uh, enforcement uh, forward SEC relative to the crypto industry throughout the back half of 22 and 23 and a continuation of that. And I think there are people and policy and personnel that have tentacles to um, Senator Warren um, and, her, and her staff in the Senate, um, whether or not that's Brian Deese and Barack Ramamurti at um, the NEC. And then there are people, obviously, like some of those folks and key personnel have left the Biden administration and have repopulated in circles that could be influential uh, to the uh, a potential Harris administration. So I think people, rightfully so, are saying, hey, people are, are policy in these administrations. Are we to expect the same in a Harris administration, and they're asking that question. Um, I think we just don't know yet. I think it's possible that people can change and they're acting at the, the behest of sort of like the directives inside the administration. Uh, I think people can change their, their opinions and that's why it's so important to engage. Uh, but I think it's just, we don't know yet. Got it. Kevin or Catherine? I'll just chime in. The, the big focus area for why Warren has been anti-crypto is money laundering and theoretical wrongdoing as a result of this ecosystem. 
Now, one of the things we haven't discussed is we also face the prospect of a, a bill that could cause outsized damage to crypto getting some sort of traction because we've seen a number of those, um, you know, so-called AML oriented crypto bills. Uh, now, of course, legislators like Warren, who are prominent legislators, are going to ha have a voice in Congress and have the ear of whatever president we're seeing more so-called anti-crypto legislators that are Democrats, I would say I'm very optimistic that that's softening a bit. You know, a year ago, crypto was feeling extremely partisan, and it, it made me very sad, frankly. Um, that's warming up a little bit. You know, we saw with, with the very encouraging passage of Fit 21 that a number of Democrats crossed the aisle. So the whole point is, I think it might be slightly harder for any one legislator on a on a widespread party-wide basis to demonize the asset class. And the other contributing factor that's positive that might kind of insulate you know, widespread partisan action or presidential action that, that is perceived as anti-crypto is the fact that we're now seeing so many tier one institutions engaging with this asset class. So it's really hard to say crypto is exclusively used for money launderers when you have a significant BlackRock ETF and yeah. you have traditional financial services entities like banks, uh, both domestic and overseas, you know, with, with really blue chip reputations that are now cautiously re-entering the fray post-2022 and that volatility. Makes sense. Can I add one, one thing to that and then I'll let Kevin go? Please. I, I would on the AML piece, I, I think you're entirely right. It has been the elephant in the room and the negotiating leverage that has been held back and sort of halted the progression of stablecoin legislation in particular. But if you if you think about it, if you have like a well-regulated stablecoin uh, and a federal licensing regime for stablecoin issuers, like the freeze and seize capabilities of online internet dollars are way better than retracting and pulling back either money that's flowing illegally from a bank to bank to a uh, third party at the end receiving end, um, or for just $100 bills that are in circulation. And we know as a statistical fact that $100 bills in circulation are the most like favored use of criminal actors. I would say the, the other thing that we should be watching is that, and I think just to be fair to the this this Treasury Department and previous Treasury Departments, they, the the a division at the Treasury Department, which is the intelligence agencies and runs FinCEN, has had an outsized influence in every Treasury Department since 9-11, uh, in every administration. And I think what we can be honest about is one of the red lines in the sand for the crypto industry is the application of the Bank Secrecy Act to tech infrastructure, to nodes, to miners, to validators, to software developers, and uh, immutable smart contract code and like that that's a open litigation question for the the agency so we have to be at, at, i think at some level you're not going to get everything that you want as an industry and legislation there's going to be some trade relative to aml that i think the industry will have to get comfortable with if they want to get other things done opinion though kevin yeah, I would say so. Uh, Warren introduced uh, Damla, uh, and that bill basically says that all crypto entities and even infrastructure are financial institutions under the Bank Secrecy Act. Um, and I think the reaction from Washington is, is that goes too far, right? Uh, for example, Senator Marshall of Kansas was an original co-sponsor of that bill, and he recently got off that bill as a co-sponsor. Um, and then there are multiple other uh, senators in particular that have introduced alternative approaches to some of this. So I think, well, she is good at bringing up the concern of money laundering, um, particular to crypto. Uh, I think Washington doesn't necessarily believe her particular approach is the most appropriate way of doing this. And um, it'll be interesting to see maybe this uh, fall and into the winter if for example, that uh, uh, Digital Commodities Act that Stabenow was working on, if that gets any consideration in the Senate, if there are amendments offered to it and what those amendments are around BSA AML. Thanks, guys. Um, we we scared it around it a little bit, um, but we talked about the growing influence of crypto politically. And you mentioned, uh, Catherine, the Fair Shake Pack that I think raised, what, $220 million or something 
uh, pretty substantial. Um, can you talk a little bit about the growing influence of crypto politically, both in lobbying and PAC efforts, and also just how it's seen um, by both parties uh, in a political sense? Sure, I'll, I'll kick us off if everyone sure. wants to. Tell. I, I think it's just gotten more sophisticated in Washington. I, that, that's the reality. There's been like it's been 10 15 years since like we originally learned or since Washington originally learned this technology notwithstanding the fact that like blockchain's been around for quite some time um but i think that the industry has become more mature in Washington so companies have dedicated uh resources for government affairs and regulatory affairs and policy and communications in Washington and the the engagement methodology has changed not only from direct lobbying and advocacy for specific uh, legislation, but it's also um, moved into the thought leadership community and then also the campaign community. Uh, with the campaign community, as Catherine has mentioned, uh, it, it is the in my in my recollection last time I looked the largest single issue corporate PAC in the U.S. and it's going to spend a lot of money in politics uh, this congressional cycle. Um, so what I, I think has happened is like it's matured across all of those engagement fora in Washington. The uh, thing that is an open question in my mind is lots of people on Twitter like to talk about how. Um, people in crypto are single issue voters. I, I believe that to some regard. I think we haven't seen the data that evidences that yet. And we'll know after this election whether or not that's true. If it is true, it's really important because then you have a single issue voting block that is important to every political party and every congressional district. And you can start to look at the um, the post-election voter file data and you can splice that and you can say, all right, in uh, New York X congressional district and in Ohio Senate map, there's 40,000 voters in Ohio that care about uh, crypto. And if you can do that, you can show up to any campaign, Republican or Democrat, and just be an important and influential voice. I don't think we know that entirely yet. Got it. Catherine or Kevin? I think that's well said. And the other point I'll make is for the longest time, crypto was perceived as harming individual average Americans, you know, preying on retail investors, et cetera. I would like to think that that perception is changing, uh, that, it, that it presents some opportunity. Now, one of the things that is most impactful on a, on a state level to a legislator is saying, we have American jobs in crypto and we're seeing additional job creation despite kind of a bit of a flight overseas we've seen, you know, to date with crypto companies, despite a lot of crypto companies going overseas or creating entities overseas, we're still seeing growth, significant growth of American jobs in the United States tied to Web3. So where there's jobs, where there's revenue, where there's kind of the natural maturation of a nascent industry, I've always said that 2022 was extremely painful for crypto, but it might have been necessary because it spurred kind of a, a very necessary growth and sophistication to some degree within the industry. There's a lot more interest in hiring lawyers earlier, for example, hiring risk, considering compliance, considering registration, not, you know, not relying on bad debt. That maturation is, I think, being felt and recognized to some degree on the policy front as well. So that's a, that's a good thing. Great, Kevin. Yeah, I, I think honestly, the the actions taken by Senator Schumer are very indicative of how important the crypto industry is um, to the elections. Right, uh, the fact that in May there was a Senate vote on the repeal of SAB 121, despite the president saying he was going to veto it, and Kinsler actively lobbying against that, is quite significant. And t eleven of his colleagues on the Democratic side uh, also voted for it. Um, and then you, 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 we've talked about this, but like. Schumer's rhetoric uh, around DNC and I think the Crypto for Harris call about working with Stabenow on this market structure bill that I think his actions are very telling that like they're paying attention to what the industry is saying, what investors are saying, um, and then also like just like cognizance of like what this industry has in terms of potential for the jobs, for the innovation, um, for America. Um, so, yeah, I, I think our influence as an industry is only growing. Right. Um, 
a little bit of current events here uh, since we talked about AML um, and things like that. Um, the, there's been a lot of attention, you know, just over the last couple of days uh, to the Telegram founder um, being uh, detained in France over a, you know, a long list of potential charges not being charged yet. And some people raising uh, free speech issues and things like that. Uh, Telegram is obviously an important both crypto project and that it has a prominent token and also that it is a technology that is utilized tremendously uh, in the digital asset ecosystem for communication. Is there anything, I mean, there's been a lot of um, like praise for uh, Mika, uh, the European regulation and framework um, that and a lot of companies have relocated there. Do you see anything that's going on in the speech or like the broader realm that might slow that down or give people pause? Kathy, you want to take that? Well, one of the things that's really notable that I'm, I'm not sure a lot of people are aware of is that there's something called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And it was implemented, I think, almost 30 years ago to protect internet platforms from liability for all of the, of the bad things third parties say or do on them. You know, it's why Facebook can't be felt, held liable for human trafficking that takes place on Facebook. The reason that law was passed is because all the legislators saw the internet as a good thing and wanted to help facilitate the growth of the internet. If crypto had a section 230 of the CDA, that would make this telegram situation impossible, at least in the United States. But we continue to see similar scenarios where crypto is furious because, and I guess Telegram it certainly isn't a crypto thing, I should say. It's, it's more of an electronic communication issue. Yeah. Uh, but this issue is, is felt very keenly by crypto because the fear is that this Telegram case is going to set precedent for liability of builders um, that, you know, wrongdoers are using their platforms to do X, Y, Z. Uh, there's no shield right now. So that's something that I think the whole ecosystem is going to have to grapple with in that what, if anything, can uh, you know a blockchain do or a layer two or even an exchange, for example, uh, name it, um, to prevent wrongdoers from using the technology for bad things? What can they do? What should they do? What are they legally obligated to do? Those are actually three slightly different questions. So there's a lot of concern and these issues really don't have an easy solution right now because there's a balancing act and a lot of part, uh, probably the most important part of that balancing act, at least from the U.S. perspective, is free speech. You know, yep. we don't want to actually move to protect uh, certain individuals and violate the rights of other individuals. This also arises in the context of consumer protection. You know, are you blocking a transaction because you think that there might be suspected wrongdoing? Well, are you really in the appropriate role to gauge whether that wrongdoing is fair or are you depriving an individual from their hard earned money? So there's a constant balancing act that I think the whole ecosystem is going to have to grapple with to land on a in a place where both U.S. and global regulators can get comfortable that the point of all of this isn't really, you know, going to present a national security risk or facilitate a massive ecosystem of, uh, you know, money launderers and traffickers. Tyler or Kevin? I don't know if I have anything substantive other than I agree that we don't know in, we don't know definitively whether or not code is the functional equivalent of speech. And we don't have like sort of pri the same type of privacy understanding as section 230. I think that was well said though. Got it. Um, so just uh, we're almost coming up to the end before we like talk about the future. If, if you wanted to just summarize or how you thought about this election result, we've talked a lot about it. Um, is, it is it safe to say that despite people seeing this as a very binary result um, where kind of the conventional thinking is that a Trump administration is very, very positive and a Harris administration is either more unknown to slightly less positive. In actuality, um, what happens, especially day one, you know, day after election, and then um, incoming administration, Jan 20, that there's not a lot of immediate things uh, that are going to happen. When do you think, um, in either scenario, 
that you could actually start to see meaningful things realistically. I know we said outside chance for end of the year or something could happen, but 5% chance isn't very high. What's a more reasonable um, kind of time frame for both investors and uh, market participants uh, to think that meaningful stuff could occur in either administration? I'll, I'll give a controversial disagreement um, just to kick things off. I, I would say, um, you know, it's like the Donald Rumsfeld quote, like there are known knowns. The known known is that if Trump wins, uh, we're going to see a re-underwriting of the people and the policies that have been taken on a lot of things, not just crypto, but the things that have been controversial in crypto, like the the choke point 2.0 um, overhang. Like, I think those are things that day one can be changed because all they have to do is like the OCC, FDIC and the Fed would have to say, like, let's change like the uh, let's take down the joint statement that they made in January 2023 relative to the risks of the technology from a banking perspective. Let's uh, um, remove uh, the interpretive letter 1179 at the OCC. Let's rescind SAB 121. Those are things that can happen in, like pretty short order. You don't need any legislation. So like that is the the known known universe. The unknown universe is a little bit more with respect to Harris, but uh, I think she's signaled positivity towards the industry. We just don't know for sure um, how she is going to interact with the community and uh, take their uh, policy recommendations. We just don't know that because she hasn't been in charge. Got it. Kevin? Yeah, I, I think on the regulatory front, there's there's some room um, where they have unilateral power to, to make some changes, as Tyler has said. Uh, on the congressional front, I think we still need to see how everything shakes out. Um, I do know, though, like pretty much regardless of what happens in these elections, it's probably going to take bipartisan support to move any legislation. Um, so I would encourage everyone to continue what you're doing and do more. Um, in, in the time that we have to, to try to, to get some of these bills to move further along, whether it's stable coins, whether it's market structure. Um, I think those are key. And I, I think Catherine brought it up earlier about what like Chevron deference. Like I think uh, Congress needs to act. There, there's less room for these agencies to do things unilaterally now. Got it. Catherine? Yeah. In addition to a lot of people heard about Chevron deference being overturned, but right around the same time, there was also a significant case, JARPC, which now prevents the SEC from seeking monetary penalties in out, outside of a traditional court. They used to be able to seek them in front of an administrative law judge, like kind of an internal proceeding. So that was significant as well, because all of those developments are going to push uh, potentially uh, more cases to federal courts. So that's going to create a problem because they're already quite busy. So if there's legislative clarity that could uh, make that better, that that's a that's a driving force. So that's a big positive takeaway that I think we'll see that will not happen quickly because as I think most people understand, legislation in all of its forms takes years to come to full resolution. One of the more near terms we might near near term things we might actually feel as market participants doesn't necessarily have anything to do what, with what the president's going to do or what Congress is doing. It might be that there is a potential sense of optimism right now, which could guide strategy. So you have a business. Should we re-engage with crypto? Should we grow our crypto business? Should we give our crypto business more time to create more revenue? Should we engage with the strategic partner that has a role in Web3? Should we start diversifying into DeFi? Now, if there's a sense that the political environment is really going south for crypto and, you know, crypto's at war, like that that was very much the feeling in 2022, 2023, we saw a number of significant entities exit engagement with this ecosystem. I'm feeling a little bit differently right now on a market-wide basis. So you definitely have a number of TradFi entities kind of waiting in the wings, uh, working with their legal, working with their strategy folks, working with their policy folks to say, what does the next six to 12 months look like? Like, can we be cautiously optimistic? And if the answer is yes, then that might, you know, really guide them towards additional engagement. So that's what makes me most bullish about what this ecosystem is going to look like in the next year or two. Great. Um, Tyler, just a quick question on those things that could happen immediately. Um, taking that contrarian view, uh, those would be 
just things that came out of the executive office rescinding um, the way uh, the regulators interacted with those things, and that could actually happen rather quickly. We we think could that happen under both administrations, or is that um, more probable in one or the other? We just do we not know, or is that just th theoretical? Well, I, I think it's it's like almost with near certainty in a Trump administration. Like we know, like let's just take the custody rule at the SEC. Like we know it's really controversial, not only for crypto but for many. Uh, pieces of the traditional financial um, uh, ecosystem. And so I think it's with near certainty that it would be either like pulled down or reproposed in a substantive way. I think it's uncertain in a Harris administration whether or not they would take a relook at it. I think there are people who are heavily advocating for that being the, the posture of this, uh, of a potential Harris administration to take a refreshed look at some of these things and put it out for more substantive comment from the industry. Um, I think, you know, the the choke point 2.0 issues are a yeah. highly sensitive issue that dates back to uh, the FDIC and the DOJ in 2011, uh, going after um, insured depository institutions that bank certain industries that have been yeah. viewed by those agencies as like relatively risky uh, to provide banking services to. Like that is... Yeah a similar issue for the uh, digital asset economy in the sense that, you know, if you just take uh, the, the FDIC on their on face value in the Q4, I think, uh, call report data, they issued a, a circular questioning IDIs of how many um, institutions were providing and provisioning banking services to digital asset or crypto companies. And so it's a relatively small subfraction of the total banking economy. So I think those things like, I'm, I'm just thinking about those two as like macro issues. Like I think we'll see uh, those almost certainly get revisited in a potential Trump administration. Open question in my mind on Harris, but I think they're more receptive than this administration has been. Great. All right. We are coming up on time. Um, so let's go around just broad thoughts um, about the future. I know we've talked about the six to 12 months, but what do you really see um, like the vast majority of, of people on this call and people looking at it are wondering kind of what the environment is going to be like, what do you think is going to happen, um, and what are some likely outcomes? What, is, what does the, the future look like November 6th through the next year and afterwards? Um, and kind of how are you counseling either your principals or uh, investors? Let's start, start with you, Catherine. I'm cautiously optimistic, but I don't think we're out of the woods yet. I think we're, everyone's very impatient. I'm impatient, right? We want to get to that point. We want to get to the point where the industry has full regulatory clarity. We want to get to the point where we have, you know, true acceptance. Like I always like to begin my crypto 101 overview to uh, people who don't understand the ecosystem with, you know, Look at Econ 101. Bitcoin has all of the attributes of a successful currency. If you look at you know basic economics, except for you know a full and clear set of regulatory guidelines, like that is the missing piece in all of this. And I'm not just talking about Bitcoin, of course, I'm talking about all of Web three. Yeah. Uh, so this is a very young industry. It's a nascent industry. It's it has a lot of time to grow. It has a lot of time to mature. Um, some in crypto see that as a bad thing, <laughs> for example, uh, there's a bit of a split. Uh, I often engage in, in active dialogue about what certain facets of the crypto ecosystem sh should do about AML, for example. Like there's no solution for, for pure DeFi right now. Um, those issues need to be worked out before we have universal legislative and policy-wide acceptance and furtherance of this industry. We're not going to see that in the next year. That being said, I've been very encouraged by what I see as a level of sophistication that is really, you know, fixing what was a major education gap uh, in Washington. For the longest time, it was very discouraging. Your average legislator or policymaker really didn't understand any of this. And uh, a lot of the crypto policy people have been fighting the good fight and working really hard to educate legislators about what all of this means. So we've come, you know, we, we've made enormous strides there and that's extremely encouraging because to the average person, once they learn about this, they don't turn and run for the hills, they get more excited about it. Okay, so cautiously optimistic. Kevin. 
Yeah, I don't know who's going to win, like the House, the Senate, the White House. Um, I, I am, but I am optimistic that things can be better going forward, uh, whether that's on the regulatory side or the legislative side. Uh, I do want to flag that there's a $5 trillion tax cliff at the end of next year. Um, the Trump tax cuts expire. Um, so there's going to be a lot of work done on, on that matter. Uh, there are some concerns that maybe crypto could be used as a tax pay for. That's something like the industry needs to be on the offensive, uh, like handling right now. Um, and then, yeah, I, I really want to see a major crypto bill pass, whether it's market structure and that includes stable coins or stable coins is separate. Um, I think there's a real possibility of making that happen. Congress has been working on these issues for at least three years now. Um, I, I don't see it's, it's getting ripe. It's, we're getting closer and closer. So I don't see regardless. I don't see why not, regardless of what the makeup is, the White House and Congress, that that, that can't get done in the next couple of years. Great. Tyler, bring us home. I, I would say I'm bullish on things, even though there are lots of problems that like we like to gripe about in the industry and there's lots of nuanced issues. Like just think about like the things that have changed over the over the recent years. Like we have like a regulated ecosystem where people can buy Bitcoin ETFs. Like that's that's different. Same with ETH. And like we didn't have that um, not too long ago. And so I think the even though the acceleration of like the policy regulatory community is not as fast as like everyone wants in the, the crypto uh, ecosystem, especially like people who work on like lobbying day to day, like Kevin and I, like we would like to see wins immediately. I think the um, we, we are seeing acceleration of these core policy issues. And I think it's it's just undoubtable at some point that we'll see like major banks issuing uh, stable coins. So like we will see it. And like, we'll see it in a not too distant future, in my opinion. And I think that'll really accelerate the other things that will come from the, um, uh, for the economy. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I can, uh, we do a lot of work with regulated uh, financial service industries uh, and work with the whole, the whole, you know, <laughs> gamut of regulators. And we are seeing definitely more engagement by traditional financial institutions, more deploying of dollars um, towards blockchain projects, re-engagement. Um, I think if people have to remember it, like the end of 2022 and FTX was an incredibly disruptive, destabilizing event, both regulatorily and, you know, for people's appetite, especially traditional people for engaging in this space. That feels like it's been cleared. And right now, I, I agree with all of you guys that it very much seems like the uncertainty around the election is just really uncertainty, which people don't like generally. Um, and will probably be game on for a lot of things just when people actually understand what the lay of the land is uh, going forward. And we too are very optimistic uh, regardless uh, of incoming administration. All right, thank you so much everybody. And thank you for everyone that joined us. Um, thank you panelists. And uh, have a great day and hope everyone